Hey, welcome again. I'm Randall Lobb from Definitive Film, and thank you for joining us today. Remember, thumbs up, share, like, enjoy, click, button, elbow, smash, whatever the verb is, you decide to demarcate this video and let us know that you like it. Give us some comments and remember to go to coverprice.com, C-O-V-R, C-O-V-R-P-R-I-C-E.com. That's right, I spelled it right. Enjoy the ultimate comic price guide and collection tool for comic collectors. We're here today, cover price definitive, tales from the flip side, and we're lucky enough to have writer, and I would say a, a rich history of comics is coming out of his keyboard, Fred Van Lenti, you're out there somewhere. There he is. That goes it, sir. You know what? I think we've all had better years in a way. Full calendar years. My 2019 wasn't that great. So uh, it's all been uphill since then, quite frankly. Uh, so well, everyone, I, and your mileage may vary. Uh, my mileage did vary. Uh, I had a pretty good 2019. Into 2020, was, I was, felt like I was going to win it all. And then right. I was in LA when all this went down and I had to drive back. I felt like I was in Twister. I was being chased, driving back. Yeah. Listen, uh, we're lucky to have you here. We're talking about dynamite, but what we want to do is kind of dig back. You uh, are around my age. You're younger, fresher faced, but you are, I think, interesting in that you're really incorporating a lot of awareness of history into your writing. So could you just tell us a little bit yeah. about not just who you are, but how you got the sort of the role you play in comics right now, which I think is is interesting and surprising for people who only know you from Dynamite Lives. Sure. Uh, I labored in the indie comics uh, dungeons in the 90s, <laughs> uh, like many creators of my age. Um, ultimately, I got a job writing for Marvel, but by the same token, uh, Ryan Dunleavy, my longtime a uh, collaborator, cartoonist collaborator, and I landed the Zurich grant, which was the self-publishing grant that uh, Peter Laird of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles fame uh, was funding comics self-publishers. And this was back in the early aughts when paper comics were still pr the primary way of getting your stuff out there as opposed to like Tumblr and, you know, web webtoons and everything else now. Mm. But uh, so bizarrely... Um, we had created a comic book series somewhat by accident called Action Philosophers that was uh, the lives and thoughts of history's A-list brain trust told in a hip and humorous comic book fashion. Uh, and to make a very long story extremely short, we got a Xeric grant for it, and it came out. And the same day my first Marvel comic came out, which was called Amazing Fantasy. Action Philosophers Amazing Fantasy. Not, you know, I, I, like a lot of people, I'd spent 10 days wanting to be break into the comic book store. But of course, you know, it's like waiting for a bus. You sit there forever and there's only two show up at once. Not only did I break into the comic book industry, but I had two titles that alphabetically were racked next to each other. Action and Amazing. Uh, and I had broken my ankle so I couldn't go to the no. comic book store <laughs> to see. So I was stuck at home in the, on, on the sofa. Uh, but Ryan was very kind enough to take photos of our comic and Amazing Fantasy side by side. It is, you couldn't have a better first end of Marvel than Amazing Fantasy, could you? I mean, as far as right. name recognition. Well, yeah, exactly. Except the fans weren't terribly uh, thrilled with me because they, Marvel did this thing to vote about remaking a character. And so they voted for, I think, without really understanding what they were voting for, is they were voting for uh, the Scorpion, which is the Spider-Man villain. But mm -hmm. Marvel remade him into a teenage female S.H.I.E.L.D. agent and fans were a little bent out of shape about that. So I had an interesting introduction to comics fandom. Uh, although ironically, a lot of the characters I created for that series will be appearing on Hulu later this uh, next month as part of the the MODOK show that, that Pat and Oswald and Jordan Bloom are doing. So uh, Fred, it's, it's amazing how what staying power these things have, you know. It, it is, it, A, I love that. I like, um, I'm a fan of, I don't know what you'd call them, forks in history, uh, forks, twists, turns. But, I mean, you hit me right out the gate with three things that I have to jump on. One, I don't know if you know this, um, our claim to fame was we did a documentary on the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and we were friendly with Ke uh, Kevin oh, and Peter. Cool. Yeah, and if Peter likes what you're doing, you're true, because Peter only responds to what he thinks as true and earnest and real. Like, there is, I don't know if you've worked with him or met him, but is... Not at all. 
you you couldn't go wrong by him I saying... I just cashed his checks. <laughs> I think that's a good person to get checks from. I he, bet. No, hey, he's... I, as far as I know, the, the Xeric Foundation is still around. I think they primarily do charity work in Massachusetts. I don't think they're really involved in comic self-publishing anymore, but uh, yeah. but I think the foundation is still around as a nonprofit. But that's testimony to you because he brooks no fools and anything that r smacks of false or, or crass or commercial, you know what I mean? He does not care about such things, obviously. Yeah. See. Yeah, and the and the folks who came out of the Zarek grant, I mean, they're you know way more famous people than I have gone through that program. So they did it for like I would say a decade and a half at least, probably longer. We were the we were the class, part of the class of two thousand and four. Uh, a good time to get into comics. There was a bit maybe there was a lull or things were burgeoning, things were growing. Uh, in my estimation, if I remember back then, uh, I was out of collecting. What was the, how did you even get to Action Philosophers? I, and can you explain it for people who don't know? By the way, I think it's amazing. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, what happened was that we, Ryan and I were trying to get into this anthology. There's this wonderful uh, small press convention in the Washington, D.C. area every year called Small Press Expo or XP, SPX. And they, at one point, they were doing an anthology and we were trying to get into it and the anthologies would have themes and the theme of, for one year was biography. And so I'd been reading <laughs> Nietzsche as one does when I was in their twenties. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I just came up with this funny idea of doing a short humorous comics biography of Nietzsche, but it would be like bundled in with your Nietzsche action figures, like he man, the masters of the universe used to be. And so the, hence the name action philosophers. And so we submitted it, but it got, uh, uh, it, the, the, we got rejected. We didn't get in the anthology, but we were like the story and we found an editor for a startup newspaper that commissioned a couple more. And so we did a couple more, but then the newspaper folded before we got paid or anything got published. So now we had basically a comic book's worth of story, you know, but with nowhere to go. Every comic book publisher in, in the country turned us down. But then some, Chris Staros actually top shelf recommended the Zurich Foundation. And we had basically exactly what the Zurich Foundation asked, which was they, they needed a completed comic. Mm -hmm. And so we did that. And uh, we thought, oh, we'll put out a couple issues and then we'll get a book deal or something. But it turned out people really like philosophy comics and we ended up doing it for several years. And uh, right now, uh, at the time of this interview, there's, I think, about 46 hours left uh, in the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. Is uh, We're kickstarting the Action Philosophers in color. Because originally it was black and white, but now we're bringing in color edition. I mean, the thing's really never gone out of print since 2003. There's been a bunch of different editions. There was a hardback edition from Dark Horse. Uh, but they've all been black and white. And uh, the kids like color. I don't know if you heard of this. The, the kids really like them color mm -hmm. comics. Uh, you'd think with manga that there'd be more of a... There'd be more of a uh, you know, North American appetite for, for black and white comics, but there you have. But uh, Adam Gazowski did our comic book history of comics and our more are currently coming out from IDW comic book history of animation. Uh, so he, we've hired him to do action philosophers and he's already started and he's doing a bang up job. I, I mean, I used to be a, a high school English teacher and I was like a head of a department and I was the guy that people come to and say, how do I make kids care about Macbeth? It, and I used, a, a, you know, the Roman Polanski Playboy movie. I don't know if you ever saw that old Macbeth movie. And, oh, sure. And any, yeah, you know, so any tool you could get to take some old shoe of history or philosophy or whatever and try and create a palatable way of saying, you know, here's who it is. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, what you did is, is exactly the tool that we need to, and that's reductive, I, I get it. But do you not think... Like you basically tried to take 10 pounds of sausage and put it into two pounds of casing, did you not? It's a very complicated job. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've described that very similar to myself, except I say 10 pounds of shit in a two pound bag. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of a, a skill I have. Is it, And you know, uh, it's great that comics are being more and more recognized as educational tools. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan and I created for the New York city department of education a book called action activists that was uh teaching middle schoolers about civic responsibility and we've just now started working on the sequel uh so that was being handed out those are comics that are being had a free to every uh fifth sixth and seventh grade middle schooler in the city of new york i, I just want to hit that again the united states biggest you know you said action activists mm-hmm 
Can you tell us what that is? I mean, just for people out there, this is we, we're we're doing this on the day that George Floyd's killer was found mm -hmm. guilty. So activism yep. is really All three counts. is uh, activism is real right now, especially for young people and and whatever you yep. want to call that generation. That group of people looks at activism differently than the people that bullied you and I when we were coming up. So could you just tell us a little bit about that title? That really tweaks for me. Sure. Uh, basically, the comic book sort of leads kids through how the New York City and New York State and federal U.S. government work. And it deals with... Uh, but then it also deals with how you can make change outside the system through protest, nonviolent protest, and various social action. And we follow a, a, a fictional kid named Nia who's organizing. Uh, to be honest with you, I tried to pick the least, you know, the most sort of uh, vanilla, uh, uh, you know, social topic. Uh, and and so I chose speed cameras. So she's trying to get a speed camera set up in her neighborhood on her block because there's a lot of speeding, you know. New York City, unlike a lot of places in the United States, we're not terribly pro car. So picking on drivers is, you know, usually a safe bet. <laughs> um, uh, but then she grows up in the fictional story and runs for sit the New York City Council. Uh, and I found out that according to the Charter, Incredible. you only need to be 18 years old to run for New York City Council. Uh, so many of the kids reading this book could be starting their political careers in a couple of years. Uh, yeah, so so then we did that, and then the DOE it was very successful. We just had a great online event with about 600 kids signed up for it um, that Ryan and I did. And so they asked for a sequel, and so now we're doing a, a sequel, which is a history of various forms of activism in New York City, which is uh, we, Underground Railroad, uh, which were a lot of major points here in, in the city. Um, the results of this, the horrible uh, Triangle Shirtwaist fire, which mm -hmm. went a long way towards improving workers' rights in the city and the country. Uh, the Young Lords, who were the this very, uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, they were a big uh, Latinx and Puerto Rican uh, empowerment uh, group, very leftist um, <clears throat> organization. Uh, and then we do Occupy Wall Street, which is a pretty recent uh, protest movement. So we're just finalizing the script on that. Brian's doing layouts. And so that's our next big project. Listen, yeah, I love this. I mean, I can't tell you how much this, for me, it, it's not just... It could be a, a, a way of trying to trick kids, right? You're gonna, let's make it palatable and it would be easy to do a crappy right. job and just shovel some content into that format or grab something that's public domain, right? And try and sure. stuff it into a format. But you're obviously committed to this. I mean, I'm looking at the comic book history of comics as well. It's another, another approach at the same thing. I mean, I'm sure there are people out there who don't really know about Jack Kirby and, and you wrote a play about King Kirby. I like, I just love that you're taking these subjects. Can you tell us about the play as well? I'm, I'm so into this approach. Sure, uh, the, the play itself, I co-wrote with my wife, Crystal Skillman, who's a decorated, well-known playwright. And uh, we, what's fun is that it, well, it's, it's the story of Jack Kirby's uh, life and sort of, uh, and the play is basically about how how did Kirby end up sort of getting erased from his own story, right? And and mm -hmm. and how did Stanley and how did how did how did the sort of corporate America kind of erase him from from his own creations? And um, fortunately, you know, since then, uh, the play was first put on in 2014, which is the year that the Supreme Court agreed to take the Kirby heirs suit against Disney and Marvel, and Disney and Marvel settled. So, fortunately, uh, since the play has been uh, was originally produced. Jack's name has gotten much more out, and his story is much more well known. Uh, but sort of as a pandemic project, we actually converted it into a podcast with the original cast. We had an original mm -hmm. cast recording uh, that was done in Midtown Comics, believe it or not. We actually taped it in a comic book store, and we converted it to a podcast. And so if you go to iTunes, you go to Spotify, or you go to the Broadway Podcast Network's main page, you can download for free, I should emphasize, uh, all four episodes of the King Kirby uh, audio drama and it's just terrific it's got original music by a great composer named bobby cronin uh fantastic performances jack kirby by Stephen ratazzi who might be known best to comics fans as dr orpheus from the venture show uh so it's just a terrific uh it just really turned out terrific and it's gotten a really smashing response i mean it's one thing to teach kids about jack kirby it's another thing to teach kids about robert crumb i i don't know quite how you could approach 
different vibes. Well, you know, comic book history of comics. We actually have one. We have one star Amazon review because we also do uh, Action Presidents, which is a series mm-hmm. for kids uh, about that is specifically for middle schoolers about the president, the U.S. presidents. We did get one star review to somebody who was like, I can't believe. You know, comic book history of comics is not for kids, and some parents get confused and they give yeah. us one star Amazon reviews, which I, I get it. It's cool. And it's not like you know, people don't have time to like you know suss out every aspect of their uh entertainment consumption and sometimes there are boobies and they're like what what happened you know, when, i wasn't expecting this and, I get and it. giant it's, it's sca- giant scary powerful women with tennis shoes that's right with with uh with uh thigh highs and uh, <laughs> and dominatrix masks i get it well i love it though that you, you you so i'm a documentary filmmaker and what i try and do is take intellectual properties or concepts or ideas and spin them around and I'm looking at your background and you're doing the same thing as a writer and comic creator and it, it's really not only fun but it's it requires a lot of you as a writer you have to know a lot about what you're talking about and that's the second thing in the first you know little thing that you said dealing with the fans how do you address this sort of remaining in canon, messing around with the things that are holy or sacred and not retconning too hard or just openly retconning and admitting it? I don't know. You tell me. How do you approach that? Um, you know, a lot of it is, I, I, you know, people complain that there's too much continuity in superhero comics and that that's what's sort of keeping people out of, you know, the more mainstream audiences have sort of appreciated it. And, I, and, I, and I've never really bought that. I, I think that all good characters if just like real people have backstories and they have baggage. And I think that's how you sort of treat continuity is as, and yeah, how you treat all that stuff. And, and then paradoxically, you also sort of have to, to st- get to the, um, the essence of these characters. And, and honestly, that is uh, what's so much fun about doing a book like Dynamite Lives, where you have, you know, the, the at least in the first series, we had the John Carter, Dejan mm-hmm. Thoris, Barsoom characters. And we had, the Project Superpower Superheroes, and I love Ms. Fury. Uh, we brought back as an as an old lady, and uh, uh, Peter Cannon Thunderbolt is. What's cool is is that because you have you have this match from Vampirella, Red Sonia, all your favorites. Uh, what's cool is, and there's characters I've never, none of them I'd ever written before. So it was exciting to sort of like, because they only have so much screen time because it's a big crossover. You really have to get their essences really quickly, and mm-hmm. and those same skills, like you were saying about the. The, the 10 pounds and the two pound bag, <laughs> those also mm-hmm. serve you well when you're trying to get the essence of characters very quickly, particularly in something like a big company crossover where you have lots of characters competing for real estate in the comic. Well, that's what I was going to say. I mean, you look at the dynamite lives, the concept at its root and, and the implementing of the new character known in the press as the groovy new character, which I like, um, it, it requires that you know a lot. You have to have juggling a lot of tools or a lot, uh, tools isn't the right word. You're carrying a lot of records of characters around or their jackets if they were criminals. And I, I see that you've done Conan. Now you're looking at Red Sonja. You've, right. you've got the Barsoom in there. You've got Vampirella. She's what, that's Archie Goodwin and, and Forrey Ackerman. And mm-hmm. um, I'm gonna forget Trina, Trina Robbins. Robbins car- uh, uh, character design. So you're, which is interesting because she becomes a feminist comics creator. And I don't know oh, if yeah, that I, I got kind of tight with her a couple years ago. She's terrific. She's a hoot. She's definitely somebody who's influenced a lot of my writing about comics history. I think she influenced a lot of people in general, but they don't realize that she played a part. And, and she went sure. head to head with some, uh, some big names, let's say, in art yeah. to say she didn't like their approach to some of the female characters. What did she say about that costume that she put Vampirella into? That's interesting for a feminist. That's a good question. I I know Trina uh, has has really kind of like poo pooed her or found her the artistic side of her career not satisfying, mm-hmm. and I've seen comments to that effect. I, I you'd have to ask her. Uh, I would like to someday. I mean, I know she's much happier as a writer and historian. I, I bet. I Based think probably you're doing work for service back then and you're told this is kind of what we need iterate sure. on this costume and yeah, i think probably... she was very young when she did the vamp- mm-hmm. vampirella thing vampirella job i should say i love writing vampirella because in my mind i write it like Bar- you know barbara steel was i do the uh, the great british uh, hammer uh, yeah. horror icon who was in uh who was in the david cronenberg's first movie shivers 
Shivers. Uh, but uh, or if you're in the United States, it's called "They Came From Within." Shivers is called "They Came From Within." Yes, they changed the title for some reason. In, in in the for the U.S. release, it's very strange. I got a Canadian VHS, so I have the correct title. And uh, it smells like maple syrup, doesn't it? <laughs> That's right. Well, it smells like it smells like Montreal porn. Because fun fact that the only people when Canada ramped up its tax breaks for filmmakers in the 70s the only people with any experience in crews in montreal or canada were the porn makers and so uh most of the people in shivers and most of the crew were all porn actors and porn uh crew so there's was, enough and, nudity in it to make it worthwhile there's a great barbara Steele versus david cronenberg story that i will not tell because it's completely derailed this interview but it's it's hilarious anyway uh so i write i write fan Pirelli in my head she sounds like barbara Steele. Are you, do you do a lot of research to get into the, I mean, you obviously adapted some Robert E. Howard stories, you know, and yeah. you know that those fans are looking for canon. So are you really intense and, and stay true well, to the old stuff or? Well, fortunately, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a pan nerd. Like I kind of know, like I read a lot of the, the Mars stuff as a kid. So I reread mm -hmm. specifically, I reread Gods of Mars because that's the second book and that has a lot of human flesh eating it so i was like and if you if anybody read is listening to this read the the dynamite uh uh valentine's day special there's a lot of that incorporated in there uh peter can thunderball i didn't know anything about his he's he's bananas he I, he's a lot of fun to write i had read all the project superpowers which was which was a lot of fun i really love what alex ross and friends did on that book um miss fury i just really loved i have trina's Trina wrote an introduction to the Ms. Fury Sunday strips. And so I, once I saw Miss Fury was on the list of characters I could use, I was like, Miss Fury is going in my comic. Because uh, she was terrific. But uh, And then, of course, we have a new character, uh, Ash Williams. And so I got to rewatch Army of Darkness 700 times. Which was fun. <laughs> Do you have a sort of a, a rule set that you have to incorporate? I don't mean necessarily for you personally or for the, you know, dynamite maybe doesn't hit you with that, but do you think about what the fans are expecting and then we have to do these set things? Like dealing with an IP requires that you hit certain points, I'm sure. Sure, well, the license, some licensors have more expectations than others. I mean, in, in terms of worrying about the fans, like, I mean, I, I just try to entertain myself and I, I'm, when it comes to this, you know, I've been doing a lot of this kind of gory slapstick because it is, I did Marvel Zombies, mm -hmm. right, at Marvel. I inherited that from Robert Kirkman and did that for many years. And so I really enjoy the genre mm -hmm. just because it's, you can do a lot of clever, horror. I love horror. I'm actually more of a fan of horror than I am an, an a practitioner. Um, I consider the the stuff like, uh, like Dynamite Lives to be almost sort of splatter stick, you know, kind of adventure. And particularly when you're putting in Ash Williams and you kind of have that real feel about it. And he's a terrific character, right? We just did the the lettering pass on the first issue. And I was like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Vincenzo artist does a great job drawing, mm -hmm. drawing Bruce Campbell and drawing Ash. He, he, he's pretty terrific. Um, but, you know, I just try to entertain myself and just hope that the fans agree with me as what I think is great. So you're not gonna, you know, some people feel the, the arm behind their back when they're dealing with so many pieces that have fan history or fan legend right. or fan expectations. You're able to push that aside. Well, you know, don't forget the, the primary um, uh, pressure is going to come from any sort of shared universe where there's continuity. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, that's something you have to deal with at Marvel all the time. Like, Loki's a woman now. And you're mm -hmm. like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to my own thing now. You know, because there's all these like, you can't use Hydra because they're all in space. You know, it's, it's that kind of stuff that you have to kind of deal with. So unfortunately, a lot of that's just completely out of your control. However, uh, with Dynamite Lives, it doesn't matter because I have my own little pocket Dynamite universe where there's zombies. And so uh, the characters are whatever version of mine of, uh, uh, that I want to put in there. And, and so uh, I get to use Va Vampirella, who I think is the, is the, you know, purest form of Vampirella. I think I like Red Sonia. Red Sonia in my head talks like the, like a Russian lady. Like, you know, the Red Sonia comes from Hikernia, which is the Russia equivalent in, Co in Robert E. Howard's Conan. Um, and so I, she refers to herself in the third person all the time. So it's like, it's like, so I don't have to actually like, you know, uh, necessarily stick with various 
uh, you know, I don't have to deal with the current version of the characters. I can just go back and reread, like, for example, the original Evil Ernie stuff that Dynamite published and yeah. with Smiley and, and just do that. You know, I don't have to actually be like, well, actually, you need to address the fact that Captain America's shield is now made of marshmallow. I'm like, why is that? OK, you know, so that's that's really where you get tripped up is 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 when you have to play when you have to share the toys that are else i don't have to share any toys this is all me you know and i imagine uh, and maybe for people that don't know you could talk about what it's like to work with dynamite because dynamite's a company that is juggling a lot of ip and really playing with their versions of uh, many different ip and many i keep saying ip like i'm a movie studio executive franchises intellectual properties characters places sure. How yeah, no, it's fun. And and Nick and, and his people have really brought together a really interesting stable of unique characters, you know, a few of which, like, I think they they have, I think they own chaos outright, the, the, all those characters. And so, you know, it's, 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 uh, but, uh, you know, movie studio owns Army of Darkness, right? So we have to clear all that with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's this interesting sort of hodgepodge, and I think we've been able to jug it really well. And I think I think the I think the fans are really really pleased with how it's all come out. I'm certainly very pleased with how it all came out. I'm I'm kind of shocked at how much fun it is. Well, Marvel Zombies set you up like you called it splatter shtick, which it's that's that should be something. If it's not something, I've not heard that before that I remember. But Marvel Zombies had a a following and and sort of set a tone. Are you kind of going down the road where you said you're not a huge horror guy? Are you seeing that this is sort of what you're doing now, that you're wielding the same tool kind of again well, and uh, again and again? And I'm a huge horror fan, particularly a huge horror movie fan. I watch two or three a week. <laughs> my, my Shudder account gets a lot of use. Um, uh, but and so it's great to like, like I'd never seen Train to Busan, which is this terrific South Korean mm -hmm. Uh, zombie movie with zombies on trains. So I rewatch. I rewatched that right before doing Dynamite and Lives. The first one, or excuse me, Dynamite. The first one now Dynamite Lives. Uh, I'm gonna have to see. There's a new. There's a new Train to Busan movie out that I'm gonna have to check out. Um, but uh, I, I guess I make the distinction is to me, you know, a lot of great horror is very is very kind of like you know has this very kind of moody tone to it, and I tend to be like, Bleh! you know, like, let's have fun. You know, it's wacky. You know. Uh, and so that's why something like Army of Darkness is very much more sort of similar. Like I, mm. I, Army of Darkness is just borderline horror to me. It's it's more, it's more adventure with gore, you know. So so that's sort of more what I sort of see myself doing. I mean, to me, horror is you know, you know, Get Out or something that's more suspenseful and kind of you know, uh, uh, a little more restrained. Something that occurs. Like I don't to think me. anyone's going to be. I guess. I guess I'm a purist in the sense that I don't think anyone's going to be scared by dynamite lives. You know what I mean? Like, or, nor are they really supposed to. You know. Um, well, what, what I think you're hitting on, if you think back to that uh, Marvel Zombies: The Secret War cover, it, it, the statement is sort of made, and and that statement is made. I, I'm I, having this happen as I sit here. That horror movies are often about making fun of horror movies or having fun with horror movies. Like horror movies sure. seem to know what they are. Maybe right. the characters don't, but the movie seems to know. And that's, that's good for you. It seems to be very much what you're skilled at doing is recontextualizing this stuff, hitting the horror elements, but then spinning it up, as you said, making the blah. Is that right, something exactly. that's conscious? Yeah. Well, not, I guess it, I guess I, I spoke too soon. I mean, I think it's it's conscious in the sense that I that I I it just sort of the groove, you know, the familiar groove I sort of find myself in, you know. So I I certainly have done mannered. I'm trying to scare you uh, horror stories before, but that they don't come as naturally to me as you know. I would say that you know I have a when you get older, you sort of see where your strengths are. And I think one of my strengths is is the splatter stick genre, where mm. it's you have these spectacular action sequences, you have over the top kills. That's what makes me if your reaction is both, oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that's sort of the reaction I'm looking for is gross but hilarious, you know. But it feels consistent with like Miss Fury, she's golden age, right? Like I think she's very sure. early superhero. 
uh, superhero yeah. comics character, and Forry Ackerman, very, like it all feels of a piece, or Sir Graves Gastly was a character from Detroit that was an, uh, you probably had one in your hometown where on Saturday afternoons sure. there's horror movies portrayed, or sorry, presented by some guy who did weather portraying a vampire or something. Right. It feels we like that. We Floyd in New Jersey. Exactly. And there's this, everybody's in on the joke. It might be scary sometimes, but we're all there for the fun. That, it feels like you're very much hearkening back to that classic American vibe. Yeah, you know, and I, I, I'm just, I think I'm just too much of a wise ass. I, I think, I think <laughs> real horror uh, tone, you need to sort of take yourself a little seriously. And, and I'm not, not always the best person at taking myself seriously. Well, it's probably for the best because, I mean, things are horrible in the world and maybe we get sick <laughs> of all the... I mean, That's Get right. Out is powerful because Get Out is about a real thing that is horrifying. Yes. That mm -hmm. we're facing daily and, and thank Christ we're not facing zombie attacks, but we're in a pandemic, so... Give it time. <laughs> exactly. So I want to talk a bit... Yet. No, it would, don't even. I don't want to walk home... <laughs> Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about, before we talk about the Pathfinder and your gaming background, I want to talk about some of the artists you're working with and what that's sure. like to see. We, we did uh, an interview with Kyle Higgins, who's a filmmaker, and he ends up having a pretty cinematic title out right now. And I'm wondering what your take is. Like, you are very kind to show your writing format, which I looked at, I thought, wow, that's really nice, and it's very clean and clear, and if I was a young writer, I'd probably be scabbing that like crazy and learning everything I could. Just interested in how there. you, yeah, it's very kind, and maybe tell people where it is when you tell this, but what sure. is it that you think when you see some of these artists who are coming in and how they're approaching it? I mean, you're dealing with some artists who've been around a long time and have a history, like Arthur Suidem, for example. So if you could just speak to that. Sure. Uh, well, if you're interested in seeing the script format, uh, which I'm very gratified at, at how popular it's become, uh, there's templates on fredvinlady.com, specifically backslash comics with an X dot HTML. Um, and yeah, mm -hmm. you know, I really like on, on Dynamite specifically, I'm working with a lot of great Italian artists. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a challenge because you're, you're sometimes uh, having to communicate folks with, who don't necessarily have a huge American or for that matter, English background. So mm -hmm. you have to kind of avoid a lot of pop culture references. Um, you got to kind of be very clear and specific, but they've been fantastic. And like I said, I particularly love how he draws uh, Bruce Campbell. Um, and uh, the, and then there's, you know, Ryan Dunlavey I'm working with on this stuff. We, we're basically married. We're common law comics married at this point we've been working together since it'll be almost 20 years it'll be 20 years in two years well that's kind um, of unfair isn't it really for for other artists like the 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 psychopathic psychopathic how do you like that the psychic link that you would have with an artist yeah. you know really well that's yeah. really something you could speak to to have somebody maybe coming in from italy or something and going here's my thinking around yeah, and, and when you're doing commercial comics, you know, the other thing, and the other sort of important reason to be clear and sort of be clear, and that's what the whole point of the screenwriting format is, is because you usually very frequently don't know, A, you don't know who you are working with. Uh, even at a big house, nine times out of ten, you're going to get whoever needs a job at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times people leave projects. So if you thought you were starting with Audist A, by the time the script actually starts to be drawn, you could be dealing with artist B. So you really have to talk to everybody in the sort of the same way of, of sort of precision. And I teach a lot now and it's very gratifying. And I do find one thing I've got to caution my students from doing a lot is a lot of them get a little obsessive over detail and sort of trying to almost treat the artist like a robot. They're trying to program with these complicated lines of code. And you've got to really let, you've got to have the, the confidence in yourself and in your writing to allow your um, artist to come up with their own solutions to things and not, you know, sit there and tell them, you know, the, the exact inclination of the angle of the arm he's supposed to be drawing. It's really like a jazz combo, right? You want to, you, you need the confidence to riff. Do you think that uh, young writers have read From Hell by Alan Moore and they think, oh, that's, I'm going to be that, I'm going to be the top, the best? and that they approach it that way, like super literary, super 
uh, proscriptive in a way? Is that what you're seeing from these young people? You know, that's a good, I mean, there's also a very famous page of uh, Watchmen floating around, right? The first page of Watchmen, mm -hmm. like, or at least the first panel is like a three page long script. And yeah, sometimes you tell people, look, you're not Alan Moore. <laughs> so, you know, Alan Moore can get away with that because he was already kind of Alan Moore when he started doing that. So uh, most people are just going to be like, screw this guy, I'm not working with him. Uh, so, you, you know, but, but uh, yeah, it's not, you know, it's not even so much literary, I would say, as it's just anal, you know, like they're just, <laughs> they just, they just have this very specific vision in their head yeah. and they're just, just very specifically like like to the point where they're describing how thick and in inches the panels are and the layouts oh. it's like guys 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 well if you think back about <laughs> back in the day somebody like um oh who would we pick there are some of the writers started as artists right and sure. they maybe wow. did a little bit of that and and i'm thinking not marv wolfman but you know, pick somebody, there are tons of them, and they would come into this business having done enough art that they think that they're going to be able to do that. And maybe then, you know, not everybody is ready to do the Stan Lee thing, like you don't have a genius like Jack Kirby where you just go, uh, the Fantastic Four fight a monster, go, you know? Like, you, you gotta find well, the spectrum. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, un, you know, it's unfortunate that I think the writer-artist, at least in mainstream superhero comics, has kind of caught away, but, I, but, you know, I mean, it is rare to have guys like, I mean, Frank Miller is an obvious, probably the par mm -hmm. excellence person who is as good writing for, if not better, writing for the artist than he is for himself. Um, Walt Simonson and, and John Byrne. I mean, they're guys from the 80s who were more, you know, that was where that was a bit more uh, accepted. Um, well, I was actually thinking, I think it was Arch Goodwin started as a penciler. Um, sure. The creator of Vampirella as a character, really, started sure. as a penciler, but... Uh, Brian Bendis started out as an artist. I mean, he'd say well, he wasn't a very good one, but he started out as one and writing his own side. I believe Rick Remender also started out as an artist. So, it, so it's it's a lot more common than, than maybe people think. Mm -hmm. So uh, to talk about handing things off and having someone, like you hand your work off to an artist, the artist goes after it. You had a, a interesting situation with Cowboys and Aliens, where if you think about that movie, when it came out, who was involved in it, how it was made, it really prefigures a lot of the explosion of Marvel stuff and IP stuff and comics into films. I'm just interested what your thoughts are, how the world is now for titles being converted, you know, from platform to platform to platform and how it was when you looked at Cowboys and Aliens at that time when it came out. Well, I was actually working at Marvel when, when they were shooting Cowboys and Aliens and you may or may not recall originally Robert Downey Jr. was attached to do Cowboys and Aliens instead of Daniel Craig and so the that was delaying uh, Iron Man 2 and so I was getting a lot of sort of joking sort of serious guff from <laughs> Marvel about about you know hogging Robert Downey Jr. but he ended up dropping on the project and everybody was happy uh look you know it's it's uh it is if you own the product it's a it's it's it is an additional source of revenue you know it's a very good thing and i think that if the movies end up being made you know that does spike the comic sales of your particular cowboys and aliens mm -hmm. wound up on the new york times bestseller list uh when the movie came out and, you know people often complain why don't you know why don't comics like why don't movies about comics like advertise comics for them why, why don't people go to see mm -hmm. you know Gardens Galaxy Volume Two, and then don't go immediately running out and getting comics. I mean, but but the simple fact of the matter is, is a people don't go to see movies based on novels and be like, I want to read Moby Dick now. You know, that's just not how people's <laughs> brain works. And also, you know, the sales of comics do spike when the movie comes out. It's just the it's just the sales of the comic that the movie's about spike. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Riley, I've done a lot of Deadpool, and when and Riley Brown and I, who's a who's a well, draws Deadpool, we did a signing in Jersey when the Deadpool movie came out. We had people around the literally around the door. It was bananas. It was it was like fifteen degrees in, in January in New Jersey, and we had this gigantic uh, turnout, and it's to do you know entirely because of the movie. Uh, so it's it's I think it's important, you know, but I think that you know the comics creators just have to keep in mind that's a different world. Yeah. And don't stake too many of your hopes on it. Um, if what you really want to be doing is is creating comics, and when it works, it works, and when it doesn't, everybody gets yeah. blamed in different capacities. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to talk about this Pathfinder, Fumbus. Uh, in the in the story, the the sort of the 
if you read the Kickstarter, and everybody should go check out the Kickstarter, you can tell us about that. It mentions that you're a longtime gamer and that you're a, you know, I guess it's his tabletop gamer, which could be board gaming of all sorts. It could be Dungeons and Dragons. It could be Pathfinder. You, you tell me, but it said that you're sort of shoehorning your love of gaming into this. I'm, I'm curious how that works out. Yeah. Um, well, I think these days the, the, the tabletop has been added to role-playing games because there's so many video games that are role-playing games. So I think people want to make the distinction between, you know, playing on an Xbox or PlayStation and, you know, actually mm. sitting around with your friends or in this case over Zoom uh, mm. these days over the pandemic and rolling dice and, and actually having a, the physical aspect to it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I've been playing Dungeons and Dragons since I was 10. Um, my first published book was in 1997 and it was a role-playing game book. It was a, it was a supplement for a game called Call of Cthulhu that I'm, I'm still play quite a bit frequently today. Uh, when I broke into comics, you know, about when, back when I broke my ankle, remember back then, uh, I stopped really playing role-playing games because I just, it was too much like work coming up mm -hmm. with stories with your friends just seemed sort of tiresome. But the game that got me back into it was in fact, Pathfinder, uh, which is sort of uh, sort of started as a variant of a particular set of Dungeons and Dragons rules and sort of became a phenomenon unto itself. And so it was really exciting to have Dynamite approach me and do the Fumbus book. I also play have played a goblin character, which is what Fumbus is. Mm. Um, I'm really bad at terrible rhyming, which is how the goblins speak. So, and it was really exciting to know that that you know this is this is gameable material. What's cool is is if you pledge to the Kickstarter to get the comic, you're not only going to get a terrific, hilarious, exciting story that continues the story of the characters from the original uh, Pathfinder series. Uh, you're also going to get actual gameable stuff about goblins and goblin alchemy and, and a lot of the magical items and, and various other things that, are, that I created for the story. The fine folks at Paizo at Pathfinder then created into things that you then can use in your, your game. This is what I was going to say. How is it working with Paizo? This is, again, another case where you're you know, you're dealing with somebody else's babies, so to speak, and you're coming in and saying, hey, I have my own history with this. How's that been? Yeah, they've been great. Uh, they've been very helpful and they obviously know the lore uh, of their world, you know, way better than I do. Um, uh, they had a very specific idea of, of what they wanted, but then once they gave me that log line, I then kind of did my own thing and they were very accommodating with what I, I wanted to do. So it's been, it's been really terrific and they've really thrown their weight behind the project and it's been really terrific. Do you feel like these pop culture mashups, and, and there are so many of them through your, not even just pop culture, like history culture and educational culture, do you feel these mashups come naturally to you because of the era that you grew up in? I mean, I'm reflecting on that now for myself. Like, is it because we're post something that it makes us so ready to do that or see that or feel that feeling? I'm speculating here. Well, you know, People have definitely commented on a certain like sensibility in my work. It did take me a while to break in. So the, by the time, you know, around 2004, 2005, I was, I was doing mainstream comics a lot. I still had retained that sensibility of an 80s kid where you saw where you had the big movies when I was growing up were like Raiders of the Lost Ark and the Donner Superman and stuff, which were all films that that were that were both very between serious right and raiders you have mm -hmm. that that horrific ending with the nazis faces melting off which scared the crap out of me as a <laughs> i think i would have been nine when raiders came out and i saw it in the theater with my parents superman ends with that horrible downer of loose lane or lois lane getting killed in the mm -hmm. in the earthquake and superman's to bring it back and that shattered me i think i was six when <laughs> That movie came out so uh so i but but on the other hand that movie has a lot of humor in it so i, I it never occurred to me to just separate between the humor and the um and the action and the horror of it all and i do think that at some point particularly in comics um i guess some people would say that's sort of the negative um you know uh, people read things like Watchmen and took the wrong conclusions from it they're like everything has to have, you know our sphincters all have to be extremely clenched and, and this superhero stuff is very serious stuff and i was always, I was always like i don't know what the hell you're talking about that well, guy's I think got a cape and he's flying you know the beauty is that it it can be and it doesn't have to be and all these things can exist in the same world i mean ash can show up with Vampirella and maybe they can go to the planet of the apes and nobody cares because all of these <laughs> things I'm theorizing here, but all of these things have become flattened by pop culture. So 
you're drawing yes. from a toolbox that's the same size. All the compartments are the same size. Is that fair to say? Yes. I, I you know, the, the problem is, is it's not, you know, people are complaining that the continuity hurts mainstream comics. I think part of the problem is that what ends up happening, and when you study pop culture, you see that there are these cycles, you know, in, in comic books, you know, the, 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 it used to be, and I don't, you know, I don't have any really up to date data in front of me, but you know, it used to be the audience turned over significantly every five years. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen is I don't see anything different. Than that. So, so each five year pocket mm -hmm. is sort of speaking to itself. And obviously, there are numerous creators. I've been lucky to have a have a have a career that's spanned longer than five years, and I've been able to go through certain cycles and reinvent myself. Um, but not everybody can, you know. Not not everybody has the opportunity. Um, and so I, I think what it has to do is these tastes become very specific because you're only speaking to this very narrow cohort of people um, who all kind of grow up in comics learning the same thing. But then those generations turn over. And so you have this kind of weird generational conflict where you some people like the old stuff and are complaining about the new stuff. Um, and when, in fact, it's all just, you know, it's all just a changing of the guard, you know, and some of us are more able to adapt you know, to the new guard than others. In a turtle interview, turtle documentary interview we did, somebody said, and I believe this was someone who worked at Nickelodeon, um, so credit her how you like. She said, everybody gets their own turtles. And what that hit me with was <clears throat> not being a turtle kid. I was more of a Batman kid growing up. I was happy with Adam West as a Batman and Neil Adams Batman as a Batman, and then Frank Miller's Batman as a Batman, and they could all exist in the same place for me. And it feels like you're of that mind as well, that all of these versions of these beloved characters and worlds are, they're open season. You can do with them what you like, because there's, as you say, this turnover means that you get to appeal to a different audience each time. And I wonder, do you approach it like that? Are you thinking about it like, it's okay, it's, the rules are are easing off. The rules we discussed, you know, earlier in this interview. I, I think I just get bored really easily, so I have to, <laughs> I have to constantly reinvent this stuff to sort of keep my interest up. I just can't. Um, and to be perfectly blunt, a lot of right. popular culture bears the bores the crap out of me. So a lot of stuff that people find really popular, I tend not to say that online because then you get the blowback. But it's, but, it's, <laughs> but it had, no, you have to say it because it has to be okay. This is the problem with fandom. Yeah, you have well, to be yeah. able to. Yeah, you know, it's it's like you know, I like sports, right? And there are a lot of nerds and people in geek media who go, "Oh, it's sports ball." I just had. Just met a stranger who <laughs> did it with someone the other day. He was like, oh, you were in the sports bar, sports ball, the most sort of condescending way. And I was just like, can't people just like what they like? And just, that's fine. And, and you don't like it. Okay, fine. And then, yeah. You don't have to, you know, it sort of dismiss this thing that millions of people enjoy all around the world. Just for me, blinded. this, we could blame Star Trek for this. And, and when I say blame Star Trek, I don't think Star Trek is at fault. I mean, that the ideas behind spinning a franchise or, or different extrusions into pop culture from a place that the rules transmuted then. Like as right. Star Trek comes up, fan culture comes up, the cons come up, you know, you have all these things happening and they sort of commodified teams around that. And you, yes. I mean, your picture on your website, I love the fact that you're at a con looking like everybody feels at a con. I don't know if you did that on <laughs> purpose. Right. That's right. That's absolutely the on purpose. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, you go to the con and you're like, why do we have to fight? Go buy your classic Trek. Yeah. She buys her next generation. I buy my fill in the blank. Like, I don't know how these things can exist in the same universe. They don't touch or they don't have to. Yeah. The, the, the one thing the pandemic has really driven home for me is I definitely could be, I would be perfectly happy with never going to comic. <laughs> yeah. How dare you, Brad. It, it, combi it combines large, it combines, for, if you're a creator at Artist Alley at a Comic-Con, that is a combination of large crowds and retail. Two things I'm not a huge fan of, so it's a little rough. Uh, but I, I, to be honest with you, I, if I turned my camera over here, I would see the pile of my own books that have piled up in my office since I have not been able to go sell them at cons. So I absolutely want to go to your con, any con organizers who are listening to this, so I can sell my books and get them out of my house. 
else. For, for people who don't know, and this, I was actually going to ask you this because I love the picture. I love the expression on your face. I love that you're looking at your phone because you're probably texting someone saying, can you please bring me a Starbucks? Like whatever it takes, get in the lineup. Uh, maybe you don't drink coffee or don't like the dark roast of Starbucks. I but drink way too much. It's, it's delicious. The idea that, um, you know, a con for you becomes something different than it is for the fans. Could you just speak to that for a bit? Just because of that photo, it says so much to me. Well, I, I guess now I have to continue plugging because I wrote a murder mystery novel in 2017 called The Con Artist that's about a comic book artist who is accused of murder at the San Diego Comic Con. He has to uh, solve the crime himself to uh, get out of jail. Um, so I sort of poured a lot of my thoughts and, and, and feelings and, and, and I, I got a very good reaction to it from people who were like, this just makes you want to go back to San Diego. <laughs> like, yeah. I feel like I failed. And kill because someone. Like, this guy is running from the, the cops, right? <laughs> it doesn't have a good time. But, uh, but it definitely evokes, you know, the, the sort of Comic-Con in, in sort of a fun way. I mean, you know, it, it, <laughs> I don't know, I, a lot of, a lot of comic book creators really like Comic-Cons because they live in suburbs, in, you know, houses where they are drawing all day mm -hmm. and they don't see anyone except their immediate family members. So the con circuit becomes a great sort of social network of seeing your friends and going to bars and hanging out and having a great time. Um, I don't really have that lifestyle i have a bit more of a social lifestyle in my real life so i don't necessarily need that uh i don't know my humble bragging i don't know i don't know i'm just well, saying you like sports I also ball live in, I, yeah, that's right that's right it's all part of the process. i guess i also live in new york city which is not like oh i'm from new york city i mean more like people come to new york city so i get to see yes. people all the time from all over the world and all over the country because they're they're in new york city for one reason or another you know so yes. uh I enjoy interacting with fans a lot. I enjoy signing my books. Uh, I enjoy doing panels and stuff. And I do enjoy the social aspect of it and hanging out with my fellow creators. But um, there is a negative side of it that I could do without. <laughs> nobody who, uh, the average person, let's say, not nobody, the average person doesn't know how much extra you is required to deal with a con over right. a set number of days. Like some of us go, yes, that's true. for me I, at, at San Diego, Saturday night, I drive away. Like I, I'm, I'm not there for the hangover. Like to me, Sunday is a hangover. I don't even drink, but Sunday yeah. feels like a hangover. And I'm friends with, uh, I don't know if you know Bill Stout, William Stout. So I'm friends with Bill. And when you see Bill on a Sunday morning, and he's an older guy, and he's an artist, and he's dealt with a lot of people, he looks like he's hungover, and you say, like, are you okay, Bill? And he's like, Sunday, <laughs> we made it. And you just it, see him squeezed. It's exhausting, like, you know, and I'm also kind of an introvert. Like, my wife is the exact opposite of my personality. She's a huge extrovert, is very outgoing. And I once read a great description of the difference between an extrovert and an introvert is an extrovert feeds off the energy from other people while an introvert is drained from it. So we did this at the aforementioned King Kirby podcast, mm -hmm. audio drama, and we did a million interviews for it. And after inter every interview, I'd be like, ah. and she would be bouncing off the walls like she had just snorted cocaine. She'd be like, this is amazing. Let's go, you know, let's run around the block, you know. Yeah. And I was like, I just want to go to sleep. Uh, so so I, I definitely know that that's really more of it with me. It's I just, just being around a lot of people for, eight to 10 hours a time is, is a bit wearing. And now, now some people are going to hear this and never book me for like, a no, I, that's what not I, what I'm saying. That's not no, what I'm saying. Especially after this year, right? You've, you felt the sting of not having, that's it's right. like, yeah, you, you don't like something when it's there all the time, when it's taken away from you, that's when you realize, isn't it? That's right. That's right. So look, I know that we're draining all your vital essence away. You're an introvert. <laughs> you're going to go watch sports ball and you're, you're going to work. This is much easier. And plus, I, I mean, I'm one guy. I, I'm not asking for too much, but I, I'm going to end with asking for something. You say something on your blog or your website that now at the end of this interview, it hits me. I see why you like Steve Gerber. I see. I totally get it. Sure. I, I yeah. see Howard the Absolutely. Duck. I see you. Right. Could you for people that are maybe new in comics or young in comics, 
and you know, why should people go back and look at Steve Gerber's work, which I think is something that many people should do. There's a lot to be said for that. Sure. Uh, Steve Gerber was a, was a very big comics writer in the 70s and, and, and uh, throughout the 80s. He, he died fairly young. Uh, he was a big influence on me as a kid. He wrote, he, he created Howard the Duck is probably his biggest claim to fame. And those early Howard the Duck comics he did with Gene Cullen are hilarious and, and still hold up. Uh, he did a great one on the man thing, which is a great or another great horror comic. Um, my personal favorite thing he ever did is he was the first regular writer of the Guardians of the Galaxy, and his Guardians of the Galaxy run from the 70s, which was very short-lived, is terrific. And weird. With Al Milgram. Yes, and I saw Al Milgram at a, at a, at a signing, and I told him how much I loved the Guardians of the Galaxy, and he looked at me like I was from Mars. He had no idea what <laughs> I don't think he really understood that someone could have loved those comics as much as I did. I imagine he gets more love for, like, Spider-Man and the Hulk and that kind of stuff. But All the Steve, did. Steve Gerber also is an intellectual property spinner. Did he not do that Kiss comic? Am I wrong? I think he wrote the Kiss comic. Is that the I one that think, had the blood? Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. I think I also think that was probably a comic that had a lot of names on the title on yeah, the splash page. Right. Would be my guess. But uh, but yeah, that's quite possible. He did. Um, he did Omega the Unknown, right? Mm -hmm. That was another one of his creations. Uh, he, yeah, so he was sort of was the pioneer of like the trippy. Yeah. You know, he did a lot of like, like the, the, the climax of his Man-Thing run is he's in the comic. He's almost sort of like a proto Grant Morrison. Like he's a character in the Man-Thing comic as the writer of the Man-Thing comic. Like that's how insane some of this stuff got. He, he's super aware of common pop culture. He's spinning tropes. He may have been influenced by the herb. He's bringing a certain youthful vigor into um, what would be, I mean, he was Jewish, but what would be an old sort of Jewish vibe like these old guys, like this is the way we've always done it. This is the way you make comics. And he's spinning the wheel and doing this crazy stuff. And I see that in you just from our conversation, but in looking back at your work and I respect that, I really like it. And for people who haven't, looked you up at a con you know you walk around artist alley and they see you sitting there looking like you're tired and you need a rest and a coffee they should stop and talk to you although and i don't know if you noticed the banner behind I me in that did, photo that, that banner gets a lot of notice that and ryan dunlavey actually told me that's what i should do is my banner and i thought do you do you want to tell people about the banner uh it's me holding my two cats who are fighting and i'm laughing my ass off and it's blurred and it's blurred, right? The the one cat, Lizelda, is 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 leaping forward, and uh, it says Fred Van Lente, serious writer person. Well, serious yeah. writer person, I thank you for talking to us today. We try to make it under an hour. Uh, if I <laughs> if I drained you too much, I'm sorry. If I interrupted you, I'm sorry. Uh, I really enjoyed getting to know you in this hour, but I also like looking yeah. back at your work. And I, I like the amazing fantasy, I like the female scorpion, and I like the fact that these little corners and little nuggets are being discovered now and being used in different media. And that's something that we see in your work throughout. So again, Fred Van Lenty, thank you so much. We'll My see pleasure. you. My uh, pleasure. And I, I guess I would just say, uh, definitely check out the Pathfinder uh, Fumbus. Kickstarter, and uh, I think the Action Philosopher's one will be over by the time it's But if it isn't, go check it out. Well, I was going to say, we'll see you on Kickstarter, and hopefully uh, we can just pick these things up somewhere down the road if we miss the Kickstarter. I think they'll be out there. Yes, exactly. All right. Thanks so much, Fred. Thanks. Okay, I'm Randall Lobb, and you just watched the cover price definitive Tales from the Flipside deep dive interview with Fred Van Lenty. We thank him very much for his time. We'll let him go back to sports ball. That's at least four times I said that. I partake also in the sport ball, so I am sorry to my fellow nerds. We'll see you next time. Thanks so much.